Great. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. So this morning, you would have noticed when you got here, you were able to come in and sit down on some chairs because someone set these chairs up this morning, very early on. In fact, where's he gone? Jim. Jim is normally here. He, he turns up at 7.30 in the morning and he, he puts all these chairs, chairs out. The tech team and the worship team, they got here really, really early to make sure everything was set up so we could have worship this morning and so the people online can be now sitting there in their jammies with their Uber Eats, joining in with the service. Um, we had people come in and set up the kids' church and the parents' room and stand there at the welcome and check your kids in when they got here, even though that's not working properly at the moment. They were there. Uh, we had people fiddling with that all throughout the week. You had a team of people up there serving coffee so you could get your legal stimulant in the morning uh, for those of you that need that sort of stuff. We had people come in and clean, uh, trim, garden, take out rubbish, you name it. We had tons of people do a whole bunch of stuff. And even for our humble little church, you, you start to get the idea that it takes a lot just to do what we do. And, and that's just on Sundays. That's not even mentioning everything else that goes on through the week. So this morning I'm going to talk about serving. Why take the step? And I've subtitled it the not very exciting version. <laughs> so strap yourselves in. Right? And the reason I've called it the not very exciting version is, is twofold. Right? One is that as a pastor I get a lot of unsolicited emails throughout the week. Lots and lots and lots of unsolicited emails. All telling me about um, this program and this strategy and how I can grow the church and how we can do this and how we can do that. Everyone's trying to sell me something. But since COVID and the volunteer numbers that have just dropped through the floor in most churches, the big thing I'm getting now is about how to drive volunteers, right? How to recruit volunteers, strategies for getting volunteers, how to keep volunteers, etc., etc etc. And what I've noticed is fundamentally the emphasis is the same thing every time and that is it is up to me and the leaders in the church to cast a compelling vision that excites people to want to contribute to something larger than themselves, right? And I get that. That's, that's absolutely fine. There's definitely a place for all of that. But sometimes, sometimes it's not about that. Sometimes it's just about doing something because it needs doing. Sometimes it's about doing something because it's actually the right thing to do, even if you don't feel all that jazzed about doing it. In Acts 2, 42, is my favourite three words in the Bible. For pastors, they're the favourite three words. And it talks about the early church and it says this, they devoted themselves. It doesn't say the apostles jeed them up, someone else coerced them to do something, someone guilted them into it. No, 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 no. They, the people, devoted themselves. There was an intrinsic motivation on the part of the early church to just get in and do what they needed to do. So if we're always waiting for someone else to motivate us to do what needs to be done, then we're actually abdicating responsibility for our own obedience and growth. And I don't want to rob people of that. The other reason it's not very exciting is because sometimes serving is not very exciting. Yeah? It's just not very exciting. It's hard sometimes. It's inconvenient. Hands up in the tech team if you were really busting to get out of your warm bed this morning at 6.30 to drive in here. Reuben was. That was it. Did you even go to bed though, Reuben? <laughs> right, okay, you just drove straight here from wherever you were. It is inconvenient. It is hard. And sometimes, let me, let me be honest, if, if you, who's ever served anywhere in church at any time? Put your hand up. You will know sometimes it's a thankless task, right? It's not that you're not appreciated, but sometimes it's a thankless task. So it's not that exciting sometimes to serve. Sometimes it's just about commitment. And that's why it's a big serving is a big check on our motivation. If we're doing it to be thanked and appreciated, to be noticed, maybe to get ahead so we, you know, we're able to move our way up the, the hierarchy or whatever it is, 
um, or we're doing it because we think it's going to be just super exciting all the time, then we're not going to last very long at all when it comes to serving. But if we're doing it for some of the reasons I'm about to go through today, then we stand a better chance of being in it for the long haul. So let me give you some of those reasons today. The first is this, one of my first not very exciting reasons. Sarah, could you put this up? Now, it sounds bad when I say the first very non-exciting reason is to be like Jesus, right? <laughs> that, it sounds bad when I say that, but, but bear with me because in some ways it's actually not very exciting to be like Jesus. It's not very easy at all. You know, Paul in Romans, he says that God's will for us, those of us who've been called by God and have, uh, have been saved, his goal for us is to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's his goal for us. You want to know what God's explicit will for your life is? Start there. To be conformed to the image of Christ. To become more and more like Jesus in absolutely every way. But becoming like Jesus is going to be costly. Why? Because it cost him. And if it cost him, it's actually going to cost us. Because in addition to all the amazing stuff that Jesus did, he modelled and taught sacrifice and servanthood and service and Jesus would even say to people if you want to follow me he didn't appeal to their their sense of excitement or their sense of, of wanting to get ahead in life or anything he said if you want to follow me you must first take up your cross die daily and follow me how's that for a sales pitch right you want to follow me it's going to be hard he set the expectation straight away in Matthew chapter 20 there's this story where the mother of James and John comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I want you to do something for me. When you come into your kingdom, I want you to give my sons the right to sit at your right hand and your left hand. And Jesus said, you don't know the type of thing you're asking there. It's not mine to, to give that type of thing. And then he turns around. Anyone else got a pushy mother? Right? And then he turns around and he says to the disciples, okay, you know how it is with the Gentiles, how their rulers lord it over people? They... Their model for leadership and is to actually just sit at the top and do nothing and get everyone else to do it, right? That's not how it is in my kingdom. And he goes on to say in verse 26, Sarah, can we put that up, please? Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your what? Servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. There it is. If you want to follow Jesus, if you want to become like Jesus, there's our starting point. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then we've got, can we put the next one up, Sarah? Philippians 2, the earliest Christian hymn. This was sung by the early Christians before they even had access to the Gospels. It was based on oral stories, oral tradition. But this is something that they would actually sing to each other, right? And Paul says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Like, be like Jesus, right? Having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Don't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, consider others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. How countercultural is that? We, are so, we get messages day after day bombarded that are telling us to look after our own interests first. But, Paul, but the kingdom of God is like, no, 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 no. Look to your own interests second. <clears throat> look to the interests of others first. And then he goes on. Can we get the next one, please, Sarah? In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, didn't equal, uh, consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, right? Being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, just so you get the point here that I'm making, can we put the next one up, please, Sarah? John chapter 13. This is where Jesus decides to take off his robe, wrap a towel around himself and wash his disciples' feet. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. 
Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So there is blessing in service for us, right? And Jesus, Paul actually quotes Jesus later on, and he says, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And sometimes that's the problem in churches, is that we're always looking to get rather than to give. And we're wondering why we're so empty all the time. The thing is, you can only take, you can, you can go from place to place and get as much as you like. It's never going to fill you up because our principal orientation, our call in life, the thing we are destined for is to serve because that is where the joy is actually found. And that is where our likeness to Jesus is going to be manifested. So to be like Jesus is not just being able to do all the cool, exciting stuff that Jesus did, like heal the sick and cast out demons. And, you know, that, that's all great. Everyone wants to do that sort of stuff. But to be like Jesus also means that we take off our robe and we wrap a towel around ourselves and we serve. It's about the transformation of our hearts so we become people who are at our core servants rather than just takers. Another really unexciting reason to step up, Sarah, can we put the next one up? Is to exercise our responsibility. When I was first posted back to Sydney when I was in the army, I decided not to move into the barracks, but I rather got a flat with a guy I knew and we shared a flat in Randwick. So two young men sharing a flat, right? Can you see where this is going to go? Neither of us had lived out of home before or in the barracks. So you can see where this is going to go. One day we realised that we'd run out of towels to dry ourselves. <laughs> we couldn't believe it. Where are all the towels? Well, if you walked into our bedroom, they were all over the floor where we had dried ourselves and dropped it. Right? Then we ran out of cutlery and plates because we'd used them. And they sat there on the sink, congealing and breeding disease. We didn't use the oven for six months because I tried to cook something and burnt it, so I just shut the door. I don't know what we expected to happen. I don't know who we thought was going to come and wash the towels and wash the cutlery and wash the plates and clean the dirty up. I don't know who we thought was going to... Were there these magic pixies that used to come in and do it? There's actually this quite funny meme that's been going around called the magic table. Has anyone seen that? Yeah. You know, it's a guy and his girlfriend is fed up and he said, look, I'll let you in on a little secret. If you put your dirty washing in this basket, it turns up on your bed all folded and neat. <laughs> and and, and she's, she's, your man, he goes, no... We've also got a magic coffee table as well. If you, you just leave stuff all over it, and in the morning you come out and it's gone, right? And then two policemen are called because obviously it's denigrated. And what the policewoman says, you know, are you insane? And the male policeman goes, no, I've got one of those too, right? So <laughs> it's, it's a guy thing perhaps, right? You know, it's a, don't get me wrong, I'm totally domesticated now. I've really, I've, I've really worked it out. But the thing was, it wasn't his responsibility to do it. It wasn't my responsibility to do it. We don't know whose responsibility it was to do it. Now, who's ever lived in a family home? Pretty much all of us, right? And I don't know what it's been like for you, but my experience has been that when you live in a family home, there is a distribution of labour, right? There should be, at least. Everyone has some sort of chore. We did it with our kids, you know. It might be... You're responsible for emptying the bin. You're washing up. Or we have a roster for washing up and you'll do the washing and you'll get the washing in and this person will mow the lawn. Does it, you know what I'm talking about? Within a family, it's, it was an understanding that if you lived in that house, you contributed to the overall functioning of the house. Yes? You don't sound convinced. <laughs> but you've got people going, mm, I guess, yeah, I guess so. Yes! If you live in the house, you all contribute to the functioning of the house, not all in the same way and not all to the same degree. I mean, my two-year-old struggled to push the lawnmower until I gave up. <laughs> you know, like, it, it, we all contribute to the functioning of the house because we want to be good members of the family. We want to be good housemates. That's just how it works. Well, Paul uses this metaphor. Can we put up the next one, please, Sarah? In 1 Timothy 
He says, although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how God's people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. Can you put up the next one, please, Sarah? He also says the same in Ephesians 2.19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and what? Members of God's household. Now, when Paul uses these metaphors, like he does about the body and other things like that, it is not unreasonable for us to extrapolate out from those metaphors all the implications of those metaphors. So when he uses the one about household, he want, he's using that because to everyone, they have an understanding of what it means to be a member of a household. And that's the thing he's trying to get across. We have an understanding of what it means to be a household. And he says the church is the household of God. So guess what? We're all housemates, right? And we all want to be good housemates, don't we? We want to be good family members. We're called brothers and sisters in Christ. So we can actually think about the church in some ways as a household. And as in our own household, there needs to be a distribution of labour. We all need to function in such a way that some people are not doing everything and the place isn't full of dirty dishes and wet towels, right? That things are actually getting done. Now, there are three ways that we can do that. And we've talked about this before over the years. One is by doing what you have been gifted to do. Paul's quite clear in 1 Corinthians 12 and other in Ephesians 4 and places like that, that by the Spirit of God, we are given special gifts. You know, um, it can be service, it could be hospitality, it could be words of knowledge or prophecy and preaching and, and so on and so on and so on, okay? So we, the principal way we serve is according to the way God has gifted us to serve. That's our biggest offering in the household of God. We use our gifts for the benefit of others. We're not all good at the same stuff, that's why we need each other. But it's not the only way we can serve. The other way we can serve is by simply doing what needs to be done. Sometimes things just need to be done and someone's got to do them. I don't have a gift for emptying bins and vacuuming the carpet. <laughs> but I do it. And I do it around here quite gladly because you know what? Sometimes it just needs to be done. So be beyond whatever special gift we have, we are servants first. So we serve in any way we can. And everyone can contribute in some way. I mean, the people who get the communion set up every single week, I doubt there's any of them that say that is their passion and their gift. When you're breaking up little bits of rice cracker and pouring juice into a cup, it's an act of service, but I don't know that it's their principal gift, but they do it gladly because it needs to be done. So don't feel like the only way you can serve is in line with your gift. In, with your gifts. It's been great, actually. We've had a bunch of people um, contact us and say, listen, I've got this particular, I've got this time free or I've got this particular skill or whatever. If you need us, let us know and we'll, we'll come and help. We've had a bunch of people help, so that's been really wonderful because they can see that things need to be done and they're just willing to get in there and do what needs to be done. But the third reason we can serve is, we do, is by doing things that no one else wants to do. That story I, I, I alluded to in John 13 where Jesus takes off his outer garment, he wraps a towel around himself and washes his disciples' feet. Jesus did that because it needed to be done and everyone else in that room was too self-important to do it. Everyone else in that room thought that that was a task that was actually below them. They were too busy thinking about how they were going to get the positions of honour in the kingdom that Jesus was going to bring, not about how they could just be servants and so Jesus set them an example and said you'll be blessed if you do this if I'm your master and I'm doing it you need to do it too because you'll be blessed if you can do it when I was at theological college we all a lot of us used to live on campus um, <clears throat> but either way when all our classes this is the days before online learning right you actually had to go into classrooms and so we would spend all day there at, at, at lectures but we had this main hall where we could hang out between lectures um, and where we would all eat lunch together as well. And so we would go down there and sometimes us students, we would make an absolute mess of the place. Um, not very good, but we would do that. We'd make a mess of the place and then the bell would go, it'd be time to go to lectures and off we'd go. And at the end of the day, sometimes like about 5.30, we'd come out of lectures and we'd stream through the main hall and we'd all go to our cars and go to our homes and whatever. 
One day, I, I'd forgotten something, and I went back about 15 minutes later. I needed to go back and into the classroom and get something that I'd left. And I went back, and when I went in, I noticed that the principal of the theological college was cleaning up. He was vacuuming and picking up all the mess that us really important theological students had been too important to pick up. And that left a real mark on me that day because there was this guy who had plenty of other more important things to do. And he didn't do it in front of us, he did it in secret. And it made me think he'd probably done this a lot more as well. But he was demonstrating the heart of a servant. And the heart of a servant will do not just what needs to be done, but will do things, other things that people don't really want to do or think they're too important to do. But that should be the core of who every single one of us who follows Jesus is. We should be those people. That's what it means to look like Jesus. I mean, church is, it, it's sad, but these days church is becoming a bit of a platform for people to show off their gifts or sell their brand or whatever it happens to be. And it's not. Church is a space for us to exercise our servanthood. That's what it is. Now, sidebar. Right. There are times and seasons in life where as much as you would like to serve, it's not practical or possible. Right? I want you to hear that because there is no place for guilt around here in relation to this. You with me? We are not into guilt, we are not into shame, we are not into coercion. If you are in that place, be it because, you know, a family situation or a work situation or a sickness, yeah, there's a whole range of things where we, if we could, we would, but we just can't at the moment. You be here and let us serve you in this season, right? Let us serve you. It, it, it might be that you are new to the church and... To be honest, you need to recover from some stuff and you just need to sit. Then let us serve you, right? You, we're, not, we're not trying to coerce you to get busy and to, to do this. Let us serve you. Are you hearing what I'm saying in this? Because that's not how we operate as a church. We are not a church that just expects stuff from people. We're a church, I hope, that will first and foremost love people and serve people before we use them up right? No, I'm quite serious about that. People, we don't have a utilitarian approach. We don't do that. You are people within your own rights who, who need to be loved and nurtured and looked after. And if that means that's all you can do for now, do that. Let us serve you. And then when you're healthy or when you have time, step up and do that for someone else, right? So that's as long as everyone there. I don't want, it's about exercising our responsibility responsibly right that's what we want to do exercise our responsibility responsibly I, I, I don't want people damaging their families or anything like that you know because you're so sold out to doing something in church that's not how we operate you will notice there's a lot of stuff around here sometimes where we just don't do it you know why we don't do it because we just don't have the people to do it and we are not going to bend ourselves into a pretzel trying to make it happen it's just not worth it Okay, we've already got some people who are doing too much and to be honest, I'm trying to get them to slow down a little bit. But we are not going to just try and do it just for the sake of doing it. If it can't be done, it cannot be done. And we're okay with that. I mean, you'll notice that, that most weeks we don't have a full team. We used to have a full team every week. Now at a pinch, we could kind of guilt people into helping out. Um, or we could set a really high expectation and say, this is what it means to be part of the worship team around here. You will turn up every single week. That you're the only person that can play that instrument is beside the point. You will turn up every week. We don't do that. We're like, no. We want people to exercise their responsibility responsibly yeah. and to be able to have a life and we'll do what we can. Yeah. And, and one day we'll have a full band up here. I've no doubt about that whatsoever, okay? One day, that'll happen. Anyway, I, I digress. Let's move on. The other unexciting reason is this. Please, Sarah, to demonstrate our love. Who's ever read the book, The Five Love Languages? The idea behind it, of course, is that we all give and receive love in different ways. And there are words, there are, there's quality time, there is gift giving and physical touch. And my favourite, acts of service, right? Acts of service. I'm an acts of service guy. I will vacuum the house, clean the house from top to bottom 
don't ask me to be good with my words, right? It's just, and it's weird because I'm married to someone, her language is words and mine's acts of service. So we're constantly <laughs> like this. So she'll say nice things to me and I'm like, just empty the bins, right? <laughs> No, it's not quite like that, but <laughs> it, it could be. Anyway, why I share that with you, because I love this verse, because Paul, Paul and me were on the same page, and he says in Galatians 5, can you put that up, please, Sarah? You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Service is an expression of our love, Right? Now, the thing about Paul's argument here in in Galatians is that there have been some people that have infiltrated the church there and through their actions, not so much their words, but their actions, they're suggesting to the people in the Galatian church that if you want to be a real Christian, it's Jesus plus a whole bunch of other things. Um, It's getting circumcised, it's obeying little bits and pieces of the law, right? It can't just be Jesus. It's Jesus plus. And Paul's big pushback on that is he gets stuck into them. He says some really harsh things. It's not the way it's meant to be. It is Jesus alone, not Jesus plus. He says, now you've been called. You are free from all of that stuff. You are free from all of those expectations. That's it. But here's the clincher. You don't have to do anything, but you're free to do something, right? It's a difference between being responsible and being obligated, right? Being responsible is about an intrinsic motivation. Obligation comes from an external pressure, right? And Paul is saying to them, you're no longer obligated to do anything. You are free from having to do anything to be in. You're already in. Jesus, because of Jesus, that's it. Now, you've got a choice what you do with that freedom. You could sit back and go, I'm in, that's it, I'm just waiting for the bus to heaven, and off I go. Or you could use that freedom to serve one another in love. Not because you have to, but because you want to. You with me? Not because you have to, but because you want to. Now, it doesn't disqualify the other thing I was saying about responsibility, that sometimes we just make those choices, right? But 12 times in the New Testament, we are told to love one another. And again, the problem with love, it's a bit of a squishy concept. What does it actually look like? What does it mean to love someone? Well, Paul says, well, one of the ways you can demonstrate your love for people is to serve. Is to serve them. And when there's nothing in it for you, just go and serve them. So the easiest way for us to solve a serving de- deficit in church is really to, to lay it on thick, to make it mandatory for people, hey, you want to be a member around here? Well, one of, the, one of the criteria for being a member around here is that you must actually serve. There are all sorts of tricks you can do that to get people to do it. And I've, I've done that in the past to my shame. I've seen it done and I don't, I'm not a big fan of the outcome. I would much rather have a church of people who serve, not because they have to, but because they want to, right? Not because they have to, but because they want to. Because I really believe that's where the growth is. That's a sign of transformation that's actually going on. Not just behaviour modification, not just people conforming to these expectations, these external expectations. People are serving because they want to, as a demonstration of love. Because we're interested in transformation around here. We do have expectations. I mean, I, I, I remember people saying it once, I think Brad was sharing once when he first came here, he was asking like, what do we do? Where, so where do we sign up? We were like, oh, whatever, you know, kind of. And it, sometimes it looks like we're a bit lax, like we don't take this seriously, we do take it seriously. And we do have expectations, but those expectations are more around a character issue, more around that we will love one another, we will on one another, we will speak kindly about one another. Those type of things. And I believe if we are seeking to be like Jesus, service is one of the outworkings of those things. We don't need to force it. We need to be clear about the opportunities that exist. But I believe if we're constantly setting expectations that we will become more and more like Jesus, service is one of those things that is going to happen for each and every one of us. You with me? All right. So when was the last time you thought about how you could serve one another, serve someone else humbly in love? last time you thought about serving humbly in love so if you're interested in serving in some way as brad pointed out today we had some cards made up just on the off chance that you might be ready to do that (laughs) what a coincidence (laughs) but we've got options there for the worship team like we said 
It takes some skill, right? Tech team, to be involved on the sound desk, graphics, camera, kids' church. Now, you might be thinking, oh, I'm not a, I can't, I've got enough to, because of compliance issues, we just need a lot of adults in the room. Sometimes it's just being a warm, conscious body in a room. <laughs> That's it, just an adult. We just need an adult in that room to make up the quota and the people who do the teachy stuff can get on with the teachy stuff and you can be the warm, conscious, sentient being in the corner, right? You can do that. Who's, who can, who's conscious right now? Right? You're already qualified. If you're over 18 and you're conscious, you're qualified to serve in kids' church. And to be honest, we could really do with just adults who are willing to go up there and help out so we can actually have more classrooms. At, and you could serve on kids' church check-in as well. Photography for social media, youth, set up in the morning, communion prep. Out at the ReStore, out at Seven Hills, we always need volunteers who want to serve in our missional enterprise out at Seven Hills. Do you want to be on prayer? Do you want to be involved in pastoral care, maintenance, IT? I spent two days this week trying to solve an IT problem here. Two days. I'm not an IT person. <laughs> I, I'm just not. It's not my gift. We even hired an IT person to come in to try and solve it. He couldn't solve it either, okay? But that just shows you there are just little bits and pieces that eat up the important people's time, right? <laughs> and I don't get to do my job, right? I don't get to do my job. And just as an, an aside, because I know sometimes it's really easy to think, ah, oh, it's really easy for you, Adrian, you get paid to be here, right? I'm just saying, I'm, this is just a statement of fact. I work Monday to Friday. Sunday is my serving time, right? I don't have another day off during the week to make up for the fact that I'm here working on a Sunday. Sunday is my serving time because you guys work Monday to Friday and you serve on Sunday. So if it's good enough for you to do, it's good enough for me to do, yeah? I just want you to know that in case you think, yeah, well, that's all right for you, you can take off. I don't. I work Monday to Friday and I serve on Sundays. I'm doing this for free. This bit, this bit I'm doing for free. If you paid me for it, I'd do a better job, but that's all you're getting for now. Right? Anyway, these are just, again, circumstantially placed right outside the door. And you'll walk past them. And there, I noticed there were pens there too. And a box where you can put them in. Today, if you've been stirred by my magnificent reasoning, right, <laughs> and hopefully by the Spirit of God, you might sign up, and we'll get back to you ASAP on that. So thank you. In the meantime, guys, let's again reinforce the fact that we are a body by celebrating communion together and the reason why we hear Jesus yeah. and being like him and following him and the example that he has set for us. Amen?